We're back with Hallwall's socially distant studio visit number 18 uh, in a series that we've been doing all during this uh, pandemic weirdness. In fact, I kind of casually refer to these as the pandemic diaries because it's very much about connecting with artists that we've shown over the years, um, seeing how they are, and what, what they're doing and how things are, where they are. And uh, today we're talking to uh, Sarah Sutton, who is in Trumansburg, New York, which is outside of Ithaca. And, you know, Sarah has the, uh, the bittersweet distinction of being one of the last two shows Hall Walls was able to have open to the public before uh, we, we started installing the, the following show. And then that didn't open because of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So that's kind of a weird and uh, a weird distinction. Sorry to begin with that, but uh, hi, Sarah, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well, considering. <laughs> so how are things, because uh, you're out slightly in the country, shall we say, not in oh, uh, any kind of urban scenario. How does it all, does it feel different? Uh, this whole situation feel different to you being out in the country? Does it uh, seem to affect you less? Uh, do you notice it less? Or are there, you know, particular things that are unavoidable no matter where, where we are? Um, well, let me see here. I was gonna see if I could actually show you a view that I'm seeing, but I don't know if I can flip this around. Um, so my studio, as you know, is in a barn, and yeah, it's very rural. Um, we're about 10 miles from Ithaca, um, and I'm pretty much, you know, surrounded by farms. This is an agricultural residential zoning. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm not sure it's that much different. I have friends in urban areas that are going out, you know, um, just as little as I am. I think... Um, the advantage is that um, I am on 14 acres, so it is an old farm. Um, we kind of use it as a hobby farm. Uh, so this is the time of year that we're usually outside a lot and I'm not you know, doing too much. I'm typically finishing the semester and um, starting to do some uh, pretty extensive gardening and uh, restoration farming. So it's, uh, as long as the weather's nice, it doesn't feel um, that different. I mean, it the transition to get here did. Um, that was abrupt and I definitely felt it. But um, on a day-to-day -day basis at this time of year, um, yeah, things don't feel that different. What about when you go into the town of Trumansburg, um, wh whenever you do? Um, are people uh, less concerned? Are they practicing social distancing? How is that working? Yeah, our, our town, our county, uh, Tompkins County, which is in the same county as Ithaca, uh, we were actually rated, I think, number one in New York State for social distancing. So based on cell phone data, nobody's going anywhere. <laughs> uh, there's not a lot going on. Uh, when we do go to Ithaca, occasionally for hiking or groceries, um, there's definitely more activity, and it always surprises me, um, but it looks like if I had to estimate, um, now there's no students in town, and we're definitely a college town with Cornell and Ithaca College where I teach, but it looks like there's about um, a third of the people out, you know, on any given day during business hours, so people are out and about, but they do appear to be wearing masks, and, um, you know, it definitely, you know, at our grocery store and um, local uh, businesses that are open for pickup are seem to be following all the protocol. I actually pick up food at two places, the Finger Lake Cider House and uh, the Lively Run. So we go to a farm to pick up cheese. And um, those two places, they have this you know, very elaborate outside pickup with gloves and you know, you wipe things off or uh, at the Cider House, they'll leave things on a table outside. So yeah, it does feel that people here are very uh, aware and very much following the rules, so. Uh, that's nice to hear, actually. Um, that the, not everybody is saying that. When I talk to people in bigger cities, it's a little, sometimes a little sketchy in terms of how much it's being adhered to. Um, 
I also wanted to ask you about remote teaching because you teach at Ithaca College and you must have been, you know, finishing up the term at some point around this time. And uh, I am really fascinated with um, the whole notion, uh, especially with art teachers having to transition to remote teaching because you're so used to, you know, looking at material materially based work in person and having a response to it that way and talking to students uh, in that sort of int more intimate direct setting and um, how have you found um, that transition? Well, uh, I have both good news and bad news. The good news is I've been on sabbatical this semester. <laughs> the bad news is I've been teaching kindergarten, uh, not college students, uh, because my daughter, of course, is home. Um, and that's been, I shouldn't say that's bad news, but um, in terms of, you know, answering your question. Uh, I still do uh, studio visits with um, BFA students in their senior year. Uh, that you know, I'm still very connected with. So I, I have the experience, um, but not as extreme as my dear colleagues who are, uh, you know, really had that half and half experience. So um, from them, I'm hearing that it was extremely difficult, but that, uh, and I heard this from one of the people you interviewed as well, uh, but having had that half of the semester actually helped a lot. Um, in particular in, in things that are really hands-on, like figure drawing. Um, the professor that teaches that for us said that, you know, he already had a good idea of people's abilities and skills. Um, so it was a little easier to transition. You know, we still, the fall is still up in the air. So um, it is possible I will have this experience firsthand. Um, yeah, I mean, do you, uh, have you thought about that much? Or do you have uh, apprehensions about that? I mean, uh, to me, it just seems very, very weird to uh, say, have to teach a painting or a drawing class and then do it remotely. And, um, or, or any other kind of, any class that isn't, um, you know, digitally based. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, honestly. I'm, I'm, I think uh, uh, safety is most important to me. And um, I think one thing that people aren't talking about yet with studio classes is that, you know, even if we are cleared to go back, at least in our program, but I could relate to, you know, many schools I've taught at, um, the protocol that are needed to go back safely are going to be super hard to implement. So we've got, you know, 16 people in a small space. And um, I'm constantly at their, kind of in their space, helping them paint or draw. Um, so I don't like the idea of um, working, you know, of, of teaching my classes online, but I've definitely already started to um, think about what that might look like. And um, I think it would definitely entail a lot of adapting, a lot of, a, you know, kind of, um, I, don't, I wouldn't be able to teach from the same syllabus. So, you know, I've heard from, friends and colleagues that uh, variety really helps, like going to kind of breakout groups. And, you know, um, a lot of people are talking about, I don't remember the program, but you can actually do a, a group critique on that platform. I think it's Canvas maybe. Um, so I'm starting to think about it. Do I want to do it? No, but <laughs> I can't, you know, since I can't really control that, uh, there is a lot of uh, a buzz about, oh, you know, don't teach your class too well online because we don't want this to become, uh, we don't want to be outsourced by technology. Um, and I personally am not in fear of that. I think it's so awkward to teach hands-on classes. Um, and some of my colleagues, I think, you know, it's even worse, say our sculpture program is pretty uh, traditional with welding and, and, you know, learning basic wood shop skills. Um, and then also print media is also pretty difficult. I think painting and drawing are doable, but yeah, definitely not ideal. So I had a natural question that sort of is an outgrowth of your work, which um, people can see a detail of one of your paintings behind me. Um, a lot of your paintings and the ones we showed at Hall Walls, uh, contain images of of ruin, of disaster, of debris, of apocalyptic musings. Um, 
you know, not that your work is prefacing anything, but has the current state of things uh, impacted your work in content or approach or, or you know, has there been kind of a, a, a meeting of something in terms of, you know, because your work ha always had that hybrid quality of, uh, uh, of disaster and frivolity and uh, we're in a moment of disaster. And um, I wonder how that's um, been reflected or is reflected in what you might be working on now. Well, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I think um, it's been pretty powerful for me that my last social art experience was the exhibition at Hall Walls. Um, and I keep going back to that because that was put, heading me into sabbatical where I was uh, hoping to really focus in um, and paint every day, like my full-time job. Um, and so to answer that, I think it's been, yeah, I don't, I'm not quite, you know, I'm still very much living it. Um, I was already transitioning the work um, after completing that body of work that was really about four years in the making. Um, I started to think a lot about um, transitioning more into, um, so I'm always thinking about complexity and thinking about kind of flows of um, the interchange between humans and nature. Uh, but for the most part, I was using human made imagery and then kind of twisted and contorted into these rhizomatic or, you know, organic root like structures. Uh, but I started to really around the time of that exhibition, um, I started to think about combining um, some more, I guess, futuristic ideas about, you know, okay, so here's how I see the world around me, here are these kind of worlds I'm inventing. Um, how can I integrate that with um, like kind of indigenous ideas about technologies and symbiosis with nature? So I was already really questioning how to do that. And that also um, definitely dialogues with what I do here on the farm. I'm restoring a meadow and um, doing a lot of uh, research in terms of growing things. So those two were already kind of brewing. Um, and I talked about this in my talk at Hall Walls, but I think a lot about Donna Haraway and speculative futures and using painting as a way to imagine, you know, really anything. Um, so in a way, this is a really like ripe and creative time for me. But in another way, um, yeah, I'm kind of stuck in terms of where do I want to go and um, my world seemed so, most people thought of it as so distant from where we actually were and kind of more metaphorical. Um, and now it isn't, it's much more literal in some ways. I, I think that one of the things that struck me the most in the media uh, were these descriptions of abandoned uh, theme parks and Disneyland in particular, you know, all over the world. And I just thought about my paintings and that's such a prominent kind of trope uh, that I use. And um, so, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely kind of um, still, I'm still in it right now, but uh, I was already making a transition. I'm feeling that even stronger. That transition feels really important. I think about it now as a way to in kind of a speculative future of rebuilding and reimagining and what that might look like. Um, and so I'm definitely pushed in that direction even more. Uh, but I think there's still so much, there's, I feel like the tragedy of my last body of work is so palpable that I'm not ready to turn these into like utopias in any way. Um, so I'm still kind of combining things. And one thing that's definitely changed is uh, because there's um, already a lot more kind of organic, literal organic reference in my work, um, I have started to transition my grayscale, you know, to a little warmer and kind of ochre based. Um, but yeah, so that's things I'm thinking about, but I, I feel like I haven't come to any conclusions yet. Well, you sent me some interesting images of some new paintings you had done, I think actually incorporating soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was doing soil experiments and um, also simultaneously looking for something to do with my daughter. Um, and I found this kids project of making paint out of soil um, and it was just mixing Elmer's glue with washed dirt 
And I found that it, it handled, we have beautiful soil here, um, it handled so amazingly. Um, and then I was already using a lot of um, basically expensive French soil. So Williamsburg paints that are um, ochres and, and uh, earth-based. Um, and so it kind of pushed me into using those more intentionally and in and of themselves. And then starting to add some of the uh, paint that I, I made. And I, so right now I'm experimenting with combining those things. Um, but yeah, all the pigments I'm using right now are um, only uh, earth-based, so clay and soil-based. Um, and that feels right. I, I like how it handles. You know, I always um, get a lot of questions about color and why don't I use color? I love color. I teach, I love teaching color. Um, so it's always, I always soul search on it over and over. Um, and I, so I went off the deep end at first, which was my plan. I was supposed to go to Yotto for a residency. Um, obviously that was postponed, but I was going to really like play around with color and get more daring and just, you know, see what happens. Like I do it every once in a while. Um, and it failed miserably like it always does. And, you know, if you want to know more about why, I'm happy to say that. But the gist is just, it gives the work. Um, I don't know, it gets too dramatic and surreal and the local color kind of takes it more into narrative and I like it to really teeter between abstraction and representation. Um, so those failed. Uh, but then that same, I've been doing a lot of plein air painting outside with watercolor. So I feel like my, you know, switching to ochres allowed me to get um, much more uh, just into temperature, you know, and very, very subtle hue shifts that are um, very satisfying for me. I feel like you can do a lot more with the space and the push and pull. Um, and, but it, it took me a long time to get there to figure out, you know, how to, how to shift it just enough without, again, turning grass green and, you know, kind of turning it into local colors. So. It's really fascinating that you were just trying to find something to occupy your daughter with, and then you ended up borrowing that in a, in a, serious and refined manner for your own work honestly that happens a lot and you know i'll be um just kind of stumble upon something and uh yeah i think you know it's important to stay open to those moments and right now everything is moving so slow um and i think i'm extra open to those moments i don't think that would have happened you know in the regular case of things so um, that's definitely one of the upsides to this. Um, and I think there's others, but that's a definite one. Just that slow pace kind of, op as a creative person, you're, you know, just noticing so much more. What are the other upsides? Lay them on me. <laughs> oh man, so many. I mean, in terms of, I guess, I was thinking about this last night, um, and I guess, you know, every up has a down, so take it with a grain of salt. But there is something fascinating to me that every person in the entire world has this common experience. So this substrate, in a way, of COVID. Um, and that is both terrible, but there's also something unifying about it. And I feel like it, it definitely helps um, me, anyway, like see what's important and kind of prioritize. Um, it definitely, for me, lays bare um, issues, you know, in our world. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, so I think there's something really humbling about it. Um, I think it also has me personally uh, made another connection to my work uh, in terms of, um, there's this great article in the New York Times, it's actually from 2012, but it started recirculating during this time uh, about the ecology of disease. So for me, this does link back to climate change and um, so many of the, I think it's 60% of the, um, the uh, kind of epidemics and diseases we've had in the past 20 years are related to uh, development and kind of getting closer to, to nature, um, things that have migrated um, through animals or forests. Um, and that's always been the case. It's just that we have more of them now. Um, so I think that is something I'm learning, just how everything is connected um, throughout the world and um, in these different spheres that we like to keep so separate. My last question 
to everyone. And uh, it's, uh, there's no wrong answer. There is no corny answer. People have been very um, good about this. Um, whenever what version of normal is returns, what's the first thing, large or small, that you want to do? Okay, I've heard, I've watched these. I've been enjoying all of them that I've watched. And uh, I've heard all the different answers, but I still couldn't really think of one. So I didn't like plan anything out. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is just, um, <laughs> just kind of wanting an ordinary day, you know, like going to get coffee. And I think a lot of people have said this. Um, a lot of people have said browsing, going to the thrift store but something about you know the pace of the day feeling ordinary so it's not one specific thing but a feeling of like just i guess you know that kind of every day i think that's what i'm missing the most um every day seems like a brand new drama and unknown <laughs> um so yeah it's a good answer so thank you, Sarah, for taking uh, some time today to chat. Uh, it's good to see you're doing well. It's nice to see you again. Um, and uh, hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, we'll see each other in person again. That sounds great. Thank you, John. I'm enjoying all of these. Thanks for doing this. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.